You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is Black Hollywood Live. Justice is served. Featuring the week's roundup and commentary on legal news. Black Hollywood Live. Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live, Justice is Served. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Justice is Served. You are joining me, your host, Chelsea Galicia, and my two co-hosts, BJ Abron and Shaka Smith. Uh, we want to again continue the congratulations party to B.J. Abron for recently <laughs> becoming a member of the California Bar. Yeah. Uh, he is from right here in L.A., Compton to be specific. Yeah, yeah. He, I love to say, straight out of Compton and straight out of <laughs> law school. Uh, he's done some work with BET in business and affairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Shaka here from Miami and some, oh wait, where was that school? <laughs> Princeton and uh, some law school, some law school, law school in DC, then came out to LA to pursue actis, acting and fitness modeling. So we've got some awesome gentlemen to provide some great perspectives on the legal stories that you should know about happening this week. We've got a jam packed, really juicy, I don't know if that's really a great word, but it, it, it's, <laughs> it there's works. a lot yeah. to analyze and look at here. And um, I guess I did say my name, Chelsea Galicia. The worst part of this whole thing is talking about myself. But just really quickly, I'm a lawyer, freelance, workers' comp. All right, that's enough about me. I want to get into (laughs) the good stuff um, that we're talking about today. Uh, I say good stuff, but this is a terrible, horrible story that even shocked me. So you may not be familiar with the name Daniel Holtzclaw, but you definitely should be. He was just convicted of rape not just convicted of rape, but as a police officer who did this while on duty. So it's very rare that rape victims, A, come forward, that charges ever are brought, and that there are ever convictions. But in the case where the defendant is a police officer, I mean, nobody, including Daniel Holtzclaw, thought this day would come. Because the verdict was read on his 29th birthday, and he was bawling like a baby. And I don't have a problem with men crying, but I really do not understand why this man was crying and sobbing and shaking and saying I I, I didn't do it because to me the evidence was just so overwhelming nobody could be shocked Mm -hmm. so uh, some of these details of what he did are shocking but let me leave it to you gentlemen to break this down I mean the evidence was compelling obviously in this case um, it was so many different factors that, that, that showed that he was actually guilty of this. Well, but first, let's talk about the women who accused him. Right. So these were, there were a bunch of them. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he was essentially preying on uh, women that were, uh, that could not defend themselves. He, were pray- he was preying on minority women. He was praying, praying on, uh, I believe it was even some older women. And they were all in lower income. Right. Yes. Most right. of them were young. They were all poor. The majority of them were black. Right. The other two were minorities also. Uh, they were prostitutes, drug addicts, people with records of their own. Essentially people who a jury would not believe or, or yeah. just even not even just a jury, just anyone. Right. And most of them were young, believe. but this guy got caught because he did this thing where he was on duty and he would pull somebody over and then... Uh, make them lift their shirt or right. put down their pants and then he would rape them right. or uh, Even assault to the them. extent that yeah. it was, I believe, an incident that took place in the hospital, am I correct? Yes, that right. was the first one where he was there to, you know, take care of a woman who was coming out of a drug high who was cuffed to the hospital bed. Right. He took advantage of her and then there was a nurse in the room that asked her, were you assaulted and because the officer was standing right behind her she said no Uh, interesting to note that there are 13 women who came forward and actually the story that I just told about the hospital bed the jury did not convict him on any of the counts related to that woman's stories so he was actually only convicted for half of the crimes he was accused of there was 36 of these sex crimes 18 he was accused of some of which were first-degree rape so the the victims themselves 
are just, I mean, this is so sad that this would happen. It's heartbreaking. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's the worst fear that you have as someone in the ultimate position of trust is taking advantage exactly. of that trust. Of, especially of somebody who's so vulnerable. Yeah. And so the, the, the victims who came forward all testified, and essentially the defense put them all on trial, right. attacked their credibility, that they're drug Which is addicts. Yeah. And, uh, but yet convicted. Yeah, and it was, an all, it was an all white jury. Right. And so when I read this before the conviction came down, I was a little nervous. Um, but they had a lot of evidence, a lot of GPS um, coordinates of his car corroborated a lot of the stories of the victims. Um, and I, I think it was just, in some way, it was heartwarming to see that an all-white jury looked at the evidence on its face and yeah. convicted him there so was that there's some hope for justice. This right. story was just so repetitive. Yeah. I mean, he had a pattern, and there were things that these women could not have said the same exact thing unless it was it was all true. And so we said they didn't find him guilty of the hospital um, incident, but they did recommend a total of 263 years. Right. And, I was, and I really wanted to commend the jury on that because I thought, you know, they're really going for it. They realize the reprehensibility of this crime. Yeah. So the, the only thing left to decide is how many of those years he will serve, and that's going to be yeah. determined next month. Mm -hmm. And determined also will be whether he gets to serve the sentences concurrently or consecutively, which means all at the same time or one after the other. And I, I can't imagine they're going to do this. I, I think it, this was so heinous, and it was the fact that he preyed on women that just were, they were in terms of their voice right. at the lowest ebb. You know, I think that, that made this, makes this crime even more reprehensible. So I think he will get those um, probably after one after another, not consecutively. Yeah. And so he'll probably spend the I rest of his life. I definitely think so. His capacity. Yeah. I mean, someone in, as a police officer and in any position of power yeah. like that, they definitely have to bring the gavel hard in this particular situation. And I mean, his tears right there. I mean, and I don't they really just show that. you. Is I mean, he psych? A psycho? I mean, there has to be. Was he just really shocked? How how do you explain the tears? Well, well I, I think a lot of sometimes a lot of the police brutality that we see, it's the fact that you put on a uniform and you feel different. Just like you know, Halloween, you put on a mask, you feel different, a little bit freer. And do you I feel like a rapist when you put on a mask? That, that, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't means. understand that. But I, I think I, I think there is a cognitive dissonance a lot of times when you you put on a uniform that maybe that's a person that you are not. That's a different person. And I think for someone with a disorder, because this is a mental disorder, in my opinion. Um, I think that fed into that, and I think you know you we got to talk about screening our police departments better. And I don't, I don't know, and yeah, I and mean, we should do a better job of screening our police officers. Um, but I'm not even sure if that is the actual problem here because I think again, what's not the problem? Screening the police officer, okay. or even the educational level of police officer. What you're dealing with is a culture of individuals who think that they're above the law, and well, that's the problem. It's not just, educating yeah. these guys more because the culture doesn't matter the educational level. Yeah. The culture builds them or rebuilds them when they come. And then in. the code of silence, the loyalty among officers, yeah. gives them another layer of protection. And I think it, to to a degree, it's about screening because it's a profession that attracts <coughs> people that are looking for power, right? Absolutely. So that's there are true. people that are looking to serve and protect, but then there are people who are just like, I want a position of power. What's the best way to get it and what's the quickest route? And that's to join a police department. Right. And I think you're looking at some sort of um, disorders mentally there when you're talking about those type of people. Yeah, so I, I thought that this was probably an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, after all, you know, I read the, the, the termination letter from the police department to Holtzclaw when they terminated, because they conducted an internal investigation, talked to all the victims, and they determined that he had done this. And they fired him and, and said in that letter, your, your offenses committed against women in our community constitute the greatest abuse of police authority I've witnessed in my 37 years mm -hmm. as a member of this agency. And that was the, the police chief. Uh, so I, I thought, this doesn't really happen that often. This is a terrible, horrible, awful story, but thank goodness it doesn't happen that often because I've never felt as a woman when I interacted with police officers in the slightest bit intimidated that something like that was going to happen to me where I was forced to perform a sexual act or be arrested or killed because you know they had their, their guns with them. These women were, were afraid. But much to my dismay, we find that there have in fact been hundreds uh, actually, about a thousand officers that have lost their license to be law enforcement officers due to sex related crimes. Right. And that we probably don't know nearly the entire we story. Don't, we definitely yeah. don't. And I think that's a testament that I don't even want to call this guy um, crazy or to say that he has a psychological problem. He's a bad guy. Like, 
point blank period. People can actually do bad, and it's not always because they're psych they have a psychological issue or this and that. This guy is a bad guy, and, and, and it shows throughout the rest of these um, these thousands of individuals or thousands of officers who are actually who, who this case study showed have been released or, or lost their licenses because of these types of incidents. That is actually what's going on in the department. It's scary that it is very widespread. And what was scarier to me is that we actually don't know how many officers have lost their jobs because of this, because departments are not required to keep statistics on this. Yeah. And when agencies have performed studies, some states just didn't want to turn over that kind of information mm -hmm. and a lot of times these officers are allowed to quietly resign and then take their credentials with them to another department and start all over again. And, uh, this is so shocking. I, I, I mean it's almost worse than Holtzclaw himself. Yeah, because it speaks to the culture of of hiding this type of information and when you hide it you don't improve your screening processes. You don't, you know, you don't improve any sort and, of I mean, yeah. right after uh, police brutality, which we've talked a lot about on the show, sex complaints against officers or harassment are like number two or number three in terms of what the public complains about. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is itself an epidemic, yeah. and this is the first that I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah, I think we've been focused a lot on these shooting deaths, and that's because they are so public. We see cell phone video, but you're not getting cell phone video from these sexual crimes. You're not getting women reporting them. They're underreported. Yeah, I absolutely. think it's another another topic we really need to tackle with the police department. Well, I hope the conviction of Holtzclaw allows more women to come forward and yeah. believe that they will be heard even if they have you know a, a history that is not that mm, puts them in the greatest light and I think I think that's a good thing about this case is that it, it gave a voice to those who are heard the least so. absolutely all right so we're gonna move on to a shooting uh, that happened here in, in LA in Linwood where a police uh, officer has killed a member of the public and there is a video to capture it. Uh, we are going to show the video um, which does show the the shooting it, itself so if you don't want to see it you may want to look away here but this occurred in a busy intersection in Linwood. Uh, the police responded to a, a man with a gun. So let's roll that video if we can. So it's not entirely easy to see all the time, but you'll see the, the suspect is on the ground right there, crawling away from the officers that appear, both of them appear to be shooting, or maybe perhaps just the one. No, I think both, and actually one reloaded. Oh, gosh, okay. You can see the suspect still crawling at that point. Ultimately, so, he dies. At the scene, um, originally there were conflicting reports as to whether um, he was actually, I believe, Nicholas Robertson was actually carrying a weapon. And I think we, we have this a, picture here yeah. that shows, uh, I mean, uh, it's not clear to say that it's for sure a gun, but I it mean, what else is like one. Reasonably, yeah, yeah, that's definitely a gun to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so this is very different from the other police shooting cases that we have covered because it seems to me that we believe that this one is different. When you're carrying a, a gun, officers had ordered him to drop it. And even after they shoot him, he still holds on to it for reasons I don't understand, to me, I can understand if this is determined to be justifiable. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's unfortunate, um, but, you know, an assailant holding a gun, I think the police are justified in shooting that person. Yeah. And even, because you can see, obviously, that the gun is pointing away from officers, we have to remember that it is not just that the police have to believe that they are in imminent danger, but that a suspect holding a weapon could be imminent danger to a member of the community. And to remind you, this was, you know, obviously you can see it's broad daylight. This was a busy intersection, people around. Uh, and so I, I can see that it, a reasonable officer would believe that the public was in danger. Yeah, yeah. And these are the type of debates we should be having. Like, maybe it wasn't reasonable, but maybe it was reasonable. These are the type of debates. It shouldn't yeah, be so but, clear but cut I mean, on its face that I the think, guy is running away. I think in this situation, I mean, obviously it's, he has yeah. a gun here. The thing is, in a circumstance, he could easily turn around and shoot the officer. Yeah. And so my thing is, whenever there's a gun present, and actually you can see the gun, there's a gun in his hand. I mean, at that point, I, and I, you guys know, I bash police officers for <laughs> all of this stuff that, that that's going Generally, on. Generally, we're critical of them yeah, on yeah, the show, definitely, yes. Definitely, definitely. But in, in this particular circumstance, I think that it was definitely justified mm. uh, when, when someone's carrying a weapon 
and they could easily turn on a police officer or easily shoot someone else yeah. Um, yeah. at that point. Even though he's down on the ground, even though he just seems to be crawling away. And it, it, there's a difference between this video and the videos we've seen before. You know, and, and I think we all can see it here, and I think hopefully at home if people are watching, they can see it here too. And these are the conversations we should be having regarding police conduct. It shouldn't be someone running off in the distance. we're looking at the circumstances or, themselves. We're not just pitting yeah. police versus, you know, bystander, mm -hmm. member of the public, and then we pick a side and then always go with it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't... Facts I, are I facts. Think this whole thing turns on whether that is, in fact, a gun. Um, I mean... And, of course, the normal investigation even, should it, happen. And, but and that's yeah. my thing. It doesn't turn on whether it is, in fact, a gun. It turns on whether a reasonable person would believe that to be a gun. And yeah. to me, like I said, I mean, with the camera footage, you can't say in depth you, for sure mm -hmm. it's a it's a gun because it's a little blurry. But a reasonable person, like you stated earlier, would sh <laughs> would definitely believe that that's a gun. And as we know, all these shootings, um, they do get investigated. So you yeah. know, if there is something to you know a mitigating factor, then you know his side will be seen and heard as well. But I, I think this is the. It looks like they got it right here. Probably. All right, Chaka, you've got some words for us. Oh yeah. Football season marches on, and while your season-long fantasy team might be going nowhere fast, every <laughs> week is a new shot for glory at DraftKings.com. DraftKings is the destination for one-week fantasy football, where you can relive the fantasy draft and play for huge prizes each and every week. Challenge your friends in a custom league or join an existing one to play for your share of the billion dollars in prizes up for grabs this year. This isn't fantasy as usual, this is DraftKings. Welcome to the big time. Hurry to DraftKings.com now. Use promo code BLACK and play for free with your first deposit in Sunday's million dollar fantasy football contest. First place takes home first place takes home 100 grand and a lifetime of bragging rights. Enter BLACK for free entry now only at DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. Thank you so much for that and thank you for DraftKings <laughs> for supporting our show. Yes. And now we are bringing you breaking news on the Freddie Gray um, and the officer accused, the first of six officers accused in his death. So the first officer, William Porter, was in trial for like the last two weeks. Yesterday the jury went to the judge and said, we're deadlocked. Judge sent them back to keep trying. And then just within the last hour or so, the judge declared a mistrial. Right. So we don't know which way this jury was going, whether more of them thought he was guilty or not guilty. I mean, it could have been possible that they brought convictions on some of them, but not all of the charges. And the charges include involuntary manslaughter, that's the most serious one, second degree assault, reckless endangerment, and misconduct in office. So on none of the charges was the jury able to come to any conclusions. Now we got a mistrial, and now the prosecution decides whether they are going to retry uh, this officer. Do you think they will? Well, I mean, in, in this case, and, and if you're still looking at the, the, the picture on the screen, this officer William Porter, who's the third one from the left. Um, but this case was uh, against him is, is not as easy as, as many may think. And so obviously there may be some type of outrage because of the emotional outpour that's been going on in the community for all the police incidents. But this was not a slam dunk type of trial here. And, and so when you see a hung jury, although the jury, I believe, was majority white, am I correct? Yes. Um, in this situation, which is... Uh, well, it was actually majority white, but it was a, uh, a fair picture of the community. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I mean, nevertheless, the, the facts here and what took place, which was that he was placed in a vehicle, uh, I believe Officer, Officer Porter set him down on the bench in, inside of a police van yeah. um, in which he was later transported. But if I'm correct, he made a statement to another officer or maybe to a to, sergeant to, yeah. um, that he uh, that that he needed to be secured. And so for for a, this particular type of charge, it wasn't a slam dunk as to what actually took place. The, right. The way that I saw this, there were two... Um, main problems here for this officer. Number one, there was a policy to strap in these people when you put them in the van. Otherwise, they fly around, they've gotten injured, officers knew about this, department had been sued before, and I, if I remember correctly, there was an email that had gone out to officer days before reminding them that it is policy to strap in right. the people that they put in the back of the van. So, question number one, did he to, uh, restrain Freddie Gray in the van. Mm -hmm. well, well, you have to look at whether he was designated at, as the particular officer well, to strap him in because uh, in, in that situation, 
although he may have had some type of obligation to strap him in, if he told the other officer to strap, to go ahead and strap him in, the question becomes, is he relieved of that duty at that point? Yeah, well, we had we had no evidence that there was any designation. So I, there may have been, but we don't have any of that we, testimony. every but officer gets to point at the other one. Right, you were exactly. supposed to. You were supposed to. Exactly. But, but what we do have, though, is he when Freddie Gray asked for aid, he, went to, he told the van driver and he told his supervisor. Yes. So we do know the supervisor was there. And so I think if anyone is going to take the blame for not being strapped in, it would be the supervisor, and who seems to have been aware of all parts of the process when Freddie Gray is entering the van. And then you have the van driver who may have done some reckless driving. Yeah. So it's really hard to say that this officer who put the guy in the van, who told the supervisor and the van driver that he needed aid, would be culpable for him not getting strapped down and well, the subsequent injuries thereafter. I, I don't know police protocol, but if somebody tells you, in this case Freddie Gray, tells you, you're the officer, I need medical help, can't you just pull out your radio and call for a paramedic? Do you have, does it have to go through 30 steps? Well, the supervisor's right there, and he told the supervisor. Why? Well, see, so. but this is where you, you call in an ambulance? This is where you question that brotherhood or what's really going on in the police department. Yeah. Did this guy not make any affirmative step outside of himself because he didn't want to go against whatever the police officer and the sergeant had, the other officer. In your and scope of work, your going. scope of duty, and I think part of your scope of duty is going to your supervisor, and I think anything outside of that might make you insubordinate or... So I, but isn't it policy? Somebody asks for medical aid, you get medical aid. It well, told doesn't have to be approved. By I think once the supervisor's on site and you tell them that, and then their decision to make to look at the, the no, situation. No, I'd, I'd have to disagree that. If you see someone dying and you, you oh, report he, to your supervisor, whether you think he's dying or if you see somebody in a position where he needs aid he was, and he, you report it to your su yeah. superior and your superior does nothing, you should be obligated I, to I, go ahead and take a next I step. I agree to that extent. I just don't think that those situations are always clear. I think you probably have a lot of people who get arrested that claim they need medical aid right That's then and there. True. And so for him, he's not going to make the determination. He's going to tell the supervisor and then have him, the supervisor, make the determination. So I think that's why it was hard to convict this guy. And just when I heard the case initially, beyond the warnings they may receive days before about the van, it's hard to resonate that he didn't strap him in. That's going to end up with a loss of life. That your spine will be broken, your neck, kind will, of, your, your, your neck will be broken. But this has happened before. No, but this I'm, rough riding thing where people get really yeah. injured. I think when you're dealing with the jury, though, for them it's hard to make that connection that it was. And that's why they brought up a lot of people on the stand to say that there was that connection, but they brought up a lot of officers on the stand to say there was not that connection. And, and I bet you the jury never heard about all the previous lawsuits that the city has paid out to family and to people who have been in these vans that got so, uh, paid yeah, for, I understand, sure. I understand for the injuries. The, I understand the deadlock. It, it, it's hard to say, oh, you didn't strap him in. You should have known he would then die, um, especially if the van driver was maybe driving in a way that was but beyond. But then why not, not even misconduct in office? I it mean, sounds like he reported to his supervisor. He went to the, like it sounds like he did what he could do in that situation, and that he wasn't driving the van. Now, if the van driver drove outside the scope of the way you should be driving, he may have not known that was going to happen. I mean, how would I know that you're going to drive recklessly and try to injure this person on purpose? And see, I mean, again, what it sounds like is we're talking about a circumstance and a situation in which a police officer adheres to whatever the culture is today because because when you tell me is well he he told a supervisor and then he stepped back and he watched the supervisor didn't do anything and so he chose like hey i'm not going to do it. i can't overstep my you need to over we just prayed someone last week for stepping outside the box and actually you know being an informant and telling us what's really going on here oh, well, yeah. this guy should have made and all officers in this situation should have taken that affirmative step and made sure that he was actually secu secured or received that aid uh, well, I mean, with the facts i have i just it's just hard for me to say that with what i with what i know if there was yeah. more information i would you right. know yeah. but yeah. yeah it's hard but i definitely agree it's not it's definitely There's not no a slam, slam dunk. dunk yeah yeah and, and i i hope um that we help make sense of this and that the community understands the difficulty that the jury had looking at it the way that we've explained it and that you know even though you some people may be disappointed that they should not be outraged that this um, mistrial this hung jury is is not an outrage right. at least I don't see that right. anybody should right. be outraged by it yeah. and, and it, again it doesn't mean that the other officers won't be prosecuted as you as you and he might it. be retried right perhaps. it's possible as well yeah. Yeah. right yeah all right, so let's go on now to a, a Supreme Court case about affirmative action. 
And this one is really interesting to me. It was brought by a white woman named Abigail Fisher against the University of Texas at Austin. In 2008, she tried to get in but was denied and she thinks it's holy because of her race. She thinks that less qualified black students were allowed to take her place, essentially. So an interesting background piece that you have to know is that UT Austin takes in <coughs> the top 10% of students from all high schools in Texas. Abigail Fisher was in the top 12%, so she did not automatically uh, qualify to come in, no questions asked, per this top 10 rule law that, that UT Austin abides by. She was in the top 12, so she was in the pool of students who were looked at holistically. Now, the year that she applied in 2008, that was the year everybody was going to college because the economy was crashing. Everybody was like, I better stay in school. Uh, there were 92% of the incoming freshman class fell under this 10% <coughs> rule. So there was very few slots, only like 8% of the incoming freshman students were going to be viewed under this holistic approach and she did not make the cut. And so she sued the school. She's suing for her application feedback, which is, you know, kind of funny to me. And she did go on to graduate from, I believe it was LSU, uh, but she thinks that she would have better job opportunities now had she graduated from UT Austin. So I, I guess the, the first question here is, is let's, what, what's the, the standard first, before we get into what Scalia said, which was amazing. Um, the, the standard right now about affirmative action, like what has the Supreme Court said about it? Where are we with that whole, is it constitutional, is it not? Well, I think they, they, they found that it is a compelling interest to have a student body that's reflective um, of different viewpoints. And you are allowed to take affirmative action as a factor. It's, it's, it cannot be the whole decision. And I think part of this lawsuit, it might be a public m misperception about affirmative action when it comes to college admissions, and that it's a factor. It's not, it's not one decisive thing that gets you into college. Um, it's a factor just like the state you, com you came from is a factor. A factor just like the, co the, the high school you went to is a factor. Right. Um, if I have 20 people from one high school that's an excellent high school, I may want some people from this underrepresented high school as well. So that 21st person won't go in, get in here. So again, it's a factor, and I think it's that public perception or misperception that has kind of fueled this lawsuit. Right. It is not. You, you can't even get into college just based on your, your GPA by yeah. that self. Yeah. Or, it, you or can't your SAT point score or, your, or the sport you played or the fact that you were a captain. So there's many factors, and the, um, UT is using that as a factor in what the last 8% to make up their right. student body. So th in the Supreme Court's view, it's uh, unconstitutional for public institutions of higher education to take race into account in making admissions decisions, unless they have a compelling interest right. for doing so. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what's really on trial is the university's policy about this holistic approach and whether it's a compelling interest. Well, it's not just a, that university's policy. It's a policy Everyone, across yeah. the nation. Well, so, yeah. And I uh, think when you're taking 92%, and it, you're looking at the last 8%, to me that, that that's a case for let's make up the student body with different voices. Especially but, right. when you look at what that 92% is. It's predominantly white individuals. Yeah. Yeah. So last week, the parties presented their case to the Supreme Court. And the justices are allowed to ask the parties questions. And um, Justice Scalia did that. Um, yeah. <laughs> what questions did he ask? Yeah. Or who was going to... Well, I mean, I, I, and again, I, I can... Though I, I disagree with the way Justice Scalia phrased some of his commentary, Let, let's, he let's, does have some points as to what he said. So let me just go ahead and yeah. re read what he said. Scalia, Scalia said that there were people who, could, who, uh, who would contend it does not benefit African Americans to get them into University of Texas, where they do well. They do at, not do Excuse well. me, do not do as well as, a, uh, as opposed to having them go to a less advanced school a less, a slower track school where they do actually do better. Yeah. Uh, and, and then he goes on actually to say that most black scientists in this country don't come from schools like the University of Texas, which... I have no um, idea what the heck that has to do with anything. <laughs> and, and then he makes one last statement saying that they come from lesser schools where they do not feel that they're, uh, that they're being pushed ahead in classes that are too fast for them, Scalia said. So basically, so, do we all agree? He said... 
black students should go to slower, yeah. less advanced schools so that they can keep up. That was... And that's not even hyperbole. That's what he said. You know? Okay. <laughs> like, I, I just, I didn't want to yeah. be like the no, one to, he said, yeah. the sole interpreter of that. Okay. So that's what he said. Can you see why people are offended by this statement? And it's so worrisome because here's like our nation's, one of our nation's top legal but scholars in mind. But anybody, <laughs> but any, and well, this we know is, Scalia. Right, this is it, the well, thing. And if is, you're a yeah. law student, you know Scalia, you know his track record. But this is and even, you, you, yeah, it's kind this of a line. This is full-blown Scalia. This is Scalia. Right so yeah. as, a, as a law student, practicing attorney, you're, you're not that shocked and you're not that like. But this gives you an idea, the public, into what's, at least one, I could see maybe, I don't even know if Clarence Thomas would say But I would say, I was I was shocked by this. Uh, even knowing Scully, I was shocked by this, that he would just say blanketly, like, African Americans like should go to a Supreme less advanced Court. school. It, it's such a blanket statement. He, he didn't even parse it, you know? The thing is, is, is he's not, I don't think he's giving his opinion here. Um, what he's doing, he's actually looking at statistics that actually yield some of the stuff that he's saying to actually be true. Mm -hmm. Now, the way he phrased it is wrong, but and actually there needs to be a deeper conversation if he's going to make these statements and these allegations. There has to be a deeper statement, uh, excuse me, deeper conversation that goes all the way back to grade school because you can't just stop and say, hey, we're not going to allow people. Well, first of all, why do we have affirmative action in the first place? But, yeah, right. but, but let's say he wasn't even referencing statistics. He was referencing an amicus brief written by this UCLA law professor. So it wasn't Which like, includes those statistics. Yeah, but he he, it didn't seem to, he hadn't taken a balanced look at affirmative action before yeah. repeating these statements that so he should know. He basically, should done, yeah. what there there's this theory called the mismatch theory yeah. that if you place a, a like a lower performing student in a high performing school, you may be putting them in a situation where they are in over their head. They're not going to do well, mm -hmm. and you're going to ruin their confidence because you know they just are put in an environment where they cannot succeed. And so because of that, we may have actually been hurting minority students rather than helping them. So that is the, the theory. Mm -hmm. And that is the basis from which Scalia asked this question. But he asked it so poorly with like slower, less, I mean. And that's, he's not looking at like, because a lot of it has to do with socio socioeconomic background. And he wasn't looking at that. He's looking at race. You have. Um, and which under includes people that would benefit if you're looking at socioeconomic background and yeah. over includes people that have that are well educated minorities that you know wouldn't need a lower track school and so i think that was a problem with it i, I read a book by was it william bowen and derek bach um former president of princeton and harvard called shape <coughs> of the river and they discussed affirmative action at length and you know they found that Affirmative action benefits primarily Asians. It affects less than one percent of people. Less and than that's one in school. Yeah, and yeah, affirmative action in college admissions. And less than one half of one percent of people do not get in due to affirmative action. And so it, it's really a, a lot smaller of a problem than people think regarding college admissions. And it's not a white versus black issue. Yeah, because in some ways, affirmative action has been shown to help white women a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, in general, statistics yeah. have proven that um, the most benefited group of individuals are white women that yeah. have benefited from affirmative action. But I will still go on record and say that um, for affirmative action does need to stay. Now, I think that it does create some problems that we don't necessarily think about because sometimes, yes, it does put people in places who aren't, who don't have a certain cognitive ability. I'm not talking about race. I'm not talking. I'm talking about whether they have a certain cognitive ability. But we need to step back one step further and understand why they have that because they haven't had that privileged education mm -hmm. that everyone else has. But so for me, I see this as like. If, if uh, let's say I have a 3.75 GPA, but I had nothing else going on, I mean, you know, I had a good, stable home environment, I had no other responsibilities except to focus on school, and so I got to do all the extracurriculars and I got my 3.75 GPA, take that and then take the person with like a 3.25 who had to work to help support his family, well, yeah. who had to take care of family members who were sick or siblings because parents had to work. And that was, that, honestly, that was me in law school. And so in, in my situation, I was in a four-year program and the vast majority, more than half of the individuals in my program didn't work. And it was an evening program designed for individuals who actually have to work and, and go to law school at the same time. And so I was in that same position. But at the end of the day, 
I, do, I will still get looked over because if, if, if O'Melveny and Myers was looking for a top or center, I won't fall into that because of the various different things that I had to deal with yeah. while attending law school. So that's why we're saying that affirmative action isn't always putting right. people who aren't smart at all into schools. You I know, agree. That 3.25 student yeah. who had to overcome all those obstacles, jobs, and taking care of people could probably be just as smart as that 3.75 person. But that's the problem person. with his statement. It's a blanket it, statement. Yeah. It, it, it applies to all minorities and, and for all and for a Supreme Court justice to be so inarticulate yeah. is that part is kind of shocking I mean not that he would say it is shocking, but he, he just worded it so poorly that I yeah. can see you would just be so bowled over by the offensive nature of what he said that you can't understand that there is some theory that has some legitimate um, raises legitimate it, issues that we're talking about right now. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, like I to say, it goes back to that misperception. So, my, I, my first year of college, I, I would hear from a lot of people, oh, you got into Princeton, it must be because you're black. And it was so offensive. That because is so mean. Was, I was hearing it from people that Did I they knew, know everything, like oh, your no, GPA, they, they your They just knew that SATs. I was a black person at Princeton. And a lot of these people were people that had lower um, GPAs, lower SATs, had taken less advanced placement courses. And so in my mind, it just, it, it, it bowled me over, and so that's why I got so interested in, in affirmative action when it came to college admissions. And I think that misperception is only being fueled by these um, these comments by Scalia, and it's unfortunate. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. All right, it'll be interesting to see how this turns out. The uh, Supreme Court will probably make its decision by next summer, which is when the end of this term is. All right, so Bill Cosby back in the news. This time we don't have a new accuser. The new accuser is himself, Mr. Cosby. He is accusing several of the women who accused him of sexual wrongdoing, of defamation, and tortious business interference. So we talked a lot in, in on the show about defamation, but tortious business interference is something that I don't think we have covered since I have been here. So who wants to be a, well, a legal professor I of the day? This, I'll run down the elements to, to, to uh, have someone found of engaging in tortious business affairs. There must have been first a valid business contract or uh, the, an expectancy of a contract. So we can check that off because he had that, Bill Cosby. That was there. Okay. With, now, the, specifically the second, with NBC and, and Netflix. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the second thing is the defendant had the knowledge of that. And then that's the question as to We're we, not we sure have yet, no yeah. facts about that. So somebody can say, well, these But this was public knowledge. These deals were public knowledge. It's public yeah. knowledge, but public knowledge does not mean that the individuals yeah. who are actually engaged in these suits actually had the knowledge themselves. So yes. that, one, so that one's know, up yeah. for debate. We just know they have the potential. Right. All right. Okay. And then uh, if they did have the knowledge, they must have intentionally acted to cause or coerce a, a relationship that will uh, that will deteriorate. Excuse me, some, a circumstance that will that will deteriorate that business relationship. Yeah, and I and I do think if they had the knowledge, which we think it's a potential, but we don't know that part of this whole charges was to hurt Mr. Cosby from living the way he's continued to live in the future. So I think right. that's part of it. Or if they had the knowledge. Or their intent was to be heard. Their intent was for their to to tell their story, which they're entitled to tell if if it's the true story. So, then there has to be actual interference. And I, I, is it a, well, do we kid, know from NBC and Netflix that they dropped him because of these? Yeah, yeah. All right. So I guess that one might be. Yeah. yeah. So a, a I, I mean, check. the the big one here, and, and then it's just that the other individuals were not authorized to interfere. But I think the big issue here is did they have knowledge uh, and, and personal And I also think that that they have to show that the interference is improper because yeah. some interference is permissible and is, is legal. I think it's important for people to know that tortious business interference came about mostly because of uh, un, what we call them sort of unscrupulous competitive practices. Right. People undercutting each other and things like that that we did not want to encourage. So this is an interesting use of tortious business interference because this is not what it was originally designed for right. but could very well be used yeah. for. I think it does fall in the category. Obviously they I can't say that they stood to gain from his deterioration of that relationship. But but whether the interference is improper. So if, and that's another issue for me, is it improper for somebody to tell their story? Well, you, if have, it's to, the you, truth? you, well, you have to remember he's alleging that exactly. they're lying. So it is improper if you take exactly. him for what he says that they're lying. And he said, and they and so say they're what, telling the truth. So well, it's up for debate. But yeah, that's <laughs> it, 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 it's definitely up for debate. But if it's proven that yeah. they in fact lied, yeah. then now you start to, the intent is there now. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. 
But do and, I think this is going to go anywhere? Uh, me I personally, think so. I think I think it is because you've had these allegations for a few years now, but I haven't seen charges against Mr. Cosby. Well, we know why, I, and I think those are things they can talk about. But at, at this point in time, there's been no charges. But do we know why? Well, all well, these women have, have said that they would nobody paid attention to them. They were told by their agents, and people, to just shut up, keep that to yourself. Nobody's going to believe you. You're going to ruin your career. And all of it's plausible given that the height of his fame at the time, you know. But at the Police end of the day... Police departments did not have this record of listening to women who... But what we do have is this guy who's never been charged, choice. you know. Yeah. It's, it's been allegation after allegation, but no charges. And so I think this was... It would almost be legal malpractice for his attorney not to file the suit. I think he needed to kind of preserve his legacy and show to people <coughs> that, you know, these are untrue. Because just saying it was untrue wasn't enough. It, you needed to have some sort of legal bite behind <laughs> so it. This well, is I, would, all I mean, I wouldn't go to the extent and say it would be legal malpractice, but I think this is definitely a typical defense tactic that defense this is what, attorneys would use yeah, in this matter. And I think they waited to make sure the prosecution was going to file no charges. I think they were waiting to see if charges would be filed, and now they have this legal maneuver to kind of, in some way, maybe in public you know, perception, exculpate Mr. Cosby. So. Uh, I don't see how this is going to work out well for him. I mean, <laughs> and you have to remember, a lot of these women, I don't know um, <laughs> what particular women are named in this too, but a lot of these women were in the business. So it stands to reason they knew these contracts yep. were there. And you know. And he didn't um, bring the suit against all of them. It was yeah, only, only a like few. A, yeah. a few of them. Uh, Which I think that's pretty interesting as well. And the defamation, yeah. I think that that's, again, it all turns on whether they're telling the truth. And remember, how many women was it total? 33 or? Something like that. It, it's upwards, it, it, close it, to 50. It, it wouldn't surprise me if, I personally believe he, he did some wrongdoing, but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me if some of those women were lying and just kind of jumped on the bandwagon. And, and maybe, and that's why I said this, that makes he it only interesting. Has a few, that's why he has a number of them yeah. and not all of them. Maybe yeah. these, he had, maybe he has facts. The that other, come the other yeah. thing that's coloring my vision of this is that in the Janice Dickinson case, mm -hmm. Her attorney, Lisa Bloom, has been trying to get Bill Cosby to submit to a deposition so that they can, you know, tease out that, go, let it go to trial. Let us get to at least the, the truth of Janice Dickinson's claim. But his attorneys have put up every wall of course. to make well, that happen. Well, that's what, that's that's what, what the attorneys should do. That's what the attorneys should do. Yeah. Okay. But if you're... Or, you know, you could just eventually... I, can, I don't see how he's going to be able to avoid it. Sit for your deposition and I, have your no, deposition. And I do, know, I do know a while ago. Well, the I reason they're yeah. fighting so much is because he's probably going to say something else like look, he did in that look, other deposition but, where he admitted to using quaaludes and having sex with women. the reality is that he could face some criminal charges because of this, right? Yeah. Okay. No, so, because the statute of limitations have all expired. Do they well, no, toll no, there, when? Were, there was one or two that the, uh, the statute of limitations um, had not expired. Well, for sure on Janice Dickinson's yeah, claim, yeah, yeah, it had. Right, yeah. so, well, well, but even, even that still, that still could trickle down to the ones that are still open. And yeah. so I think that definitely in so this... So he can it, assert his Fifth Amendment right on some particular and, question. And, no, you asserted, you uh, asserted uh, yeah. across and the board. And as his attorney, I would not want him to open himself up to anything well, that might give rise. Well, of course, because I think he did it. <laughs> and you do have to remember, there was one case, I, I forgot who it was that alleged the sexual misconduct, but at the Playboy Mansion, and he had his tickets and everything that showed that he was not there at all. And there was no pictures of him there. So you do have some window for people to say some of these charges may not be true at all. Yeah. Okay, well, so. I... I mean, his attorneys are doing what they should do, and I, I think it was a smart move. To, to file this case was an absolutely, from a public standpoint, from a legal standpoint, was a smart move. Okay. I agree. Yeah. I, think, I agree. I All agree. right, maybe. I'm just too <laughs> colored by what Look, seems to be the obvious truth here. Look, you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Yeah, <laughs> no charges have been, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I believe that brings us to the yeah. end of our show. Thank you so much, BJ, for joining us, and Shaka. You thank can you. reach us, me, at Chelsea Galicia. BJ. Just B.J. Abron and Shaka Strong. Let us know what you think. Comment on the video. Please engage with us. We love to hear what you think and what stories you think we should cover. We will see you here. Well, no, not next week. We're oh. dark for a couple of weeks Absolutely. for the holidays. Yes. Yes. Happy holidays, everybody. Yes. And we'll see you after the new year. Enjoy. Yep. 
from producers Maria Menounos, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire BHL crew, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I'm your BHL announcer, Scipio. Instagram me at Planet Scipio. Thank you for tuning in. Hollywood, Hollywood redefined. redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.